Uh, the Q&A will be afterwards. Uh, we got about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, make sure your speaker output is green. If you happen to get disconnected, uh, close, uh, log on and off, and you should be able to get back on. And then um, Monday, there should be, uh, like before, a link to the uh, YouTube site with the presentation. And then also, you should see some kind of a list of and I use uh, what I call live streaming classes. I don't call them online because they're going to start offering uh, several online classes that are going to be out there for people. So let's go through this. Uh, I know we got a lot of people coming in already, and uh, we had a lot of hundreds of registers. So, uh, you know, for a lot of them, they didn't know they had to download a software. So that'll take some time for them. Uh, you know, the data changes every day. Uh, as of yesterday, we had 12,000 deaths. Uh, as of this morning, I was up at 14,000 deaths. And you can see it's, uh, it's gone up quite a bit. Uh, um, from a week ago, it, it tripled, and uh, we're over a million cases nationally, I mean globally now. Uh, U.S. is over 400,000 cases now with uh, infection. So uh, Italy is up there as far as the deaths total, and then uh, Spain and then France. Uh, we're currently uh, uh, probably right up there with Spain now, if I look at the data. Uh, it would be 14,000 for us and 14,000 for them. So it's, uh, it's really has gone all, you know quite high still. Uh, New York uh, published some data this week. Uh, they went through uh, their thousands of fatalities, uh, and they are the number one state in the United States with the uh, the COVID-19 deaths, and you can see the age group is definitely the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, um, are getting uh, the, the high percentage of the uh, deaths. Um, we don't know the number of people who are tested versus non-tested, but uh, they came out today and they also said 80% of the people uh, put on a ventilator don't make it, which is kind of a disturbing news because I didn't realize it would be that high. Uh, so. Uh, two other states said that was similar uh, results they had, and um, so there's going to be obviously some looking at the data related to that. Uh, New York Times published uh, this week uh, something about the uh, testing on the homemade masks. You know, everybody's making uh, the uh, bandana mask and uh, a couple other ones that are paper towel masks and stuff like that, which are worthless. Um, I mean, they they have you know some illusion of you know, safety and, and you know, obviously, uh, but the testing has shown that if you were to cough or breathe in, uh, it doesn't really help against the virus on this. Uh, so people are, uh, the New York Times, uh, through the uh, research that they published, and it's in the uh, uh, note section of the, the presentation, that uh, the uh, furnace filter of a 1900, which we had recommended uh, two weeks ago, 3M1900 series, which is the you know a furnace filter that uh, is pretty simple to get and obtain. You just take out the mesh of the screen and the cardboard, and you got a filter that can be sewn in a cloth mask. And this one can filter out the uh, uh, microparticles as far as remember. It's not going to be an N95, but you know you're not going to if you're breathing mostly through the mouth. This will you know work. And this is an example of a a cloth respirator. I mean, a cloth mask. I don't, want to use, I don't want to use the word respirator. Respirator is going to be like for R95. But this has had a furnace filter sewn in by Donna, and you can put it on. And and primarily, the, the seal is not going to be tight over here. Some people are playing with uh, coat hangers and uh, pipe uh, cleaners. But, you know, the a majority of the uh, breath comes right through here, and the filter is going to catch the particles that way. You know, we've tested it with the nebulizer on the Bitrix and the standard chloride, and the furnace filter does, you know, seem to work out pretty good at the 1900. And so the Times article, you know, kind of reports what we already had done before in the previous tests. Talk about the uh, uh, exposure prevention. A lot of people are talking about it uh, since the last time. Now they've pushed uh, people getting some kind of mask or face covering. Um, it's spread from person to person, and uh, six feet, our social distancing has been at least in my area, has been fairly uh, popular. People are pretty conscious about it, and the stores are helping by putting up uh, little boxes where you stand and everything else. So uh, we don't usually have any problems with it. Um, the respiratory droplets, uh, when a person coughs or sneezes, this is what's going to help hopefully prevent the, the spread. We'll talk later about the life of the virus on the surfaces. 
Again, wash your hands. Uh, hand sanitizer, soap and water, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol above 60%. A lot of these surfaces are, are ways to do it. Uh, people are making their own little bottles of, uh, you know, rubbing alcohol with some kind of maybe a little oil or something else like this. Um, they sell sand, sand tires like this, which has got hydrogen peroxide and alcohol um, that are popular also and will also help in decontamination. Again, we want to avoid touching our eyes, nose, and mouth. You know, I wash my hands as well as uh, use my antiseptic wipes today, so I'm, I should be okay. Again, we want to avoid contact with uh, people who we know are sick. Um, the thing is, is that a lot of the people are not necessarily going to all have the money to afford to have somebody deliver the food to them, so they might be out at the store. Hopefully, they're going to wear something over their uh, face and have some gloves. But... Um, you know, a lot of people are, you know, trying to minimize their exposure in the public, and that is a good thing. Again, cleaning the effect uh, distance surfaces, uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but anything you touch, uh, you know, they talk about uh, from the CDC, uh, the tables, the doorknobs, the light switch uh, handles and everything else. I'm a big fan of wearing the gloves, and uh, I think, you know, the, and you can disinfect the gloves. Um, Milwaukee's got gloves like this. They're nitro-coated. Uh, they're very popular. And what you can do in these gloves is that you can go out here and after you're done using them, you can go out and use a hand sanitizer or a wipe. And you can just take this out. And, you know, you can imagine I have both gloves on. And I can disinfect the gloves. And, you know, this is reusable because what I'm seeing, at least in my town, so a lot of people seem to be wanting to throw these on the ground afterwards, which is not very nice for anybody. Uh, seeing old masks and old uh, uh, nitro gloves on the ground or latex gloves. But uh, you have to remember when we talk about cleaning them, there's going to be some soak time that's going to be necessary. You just can't do it for five seconds and expect everything's going to be gone. Uh, well, I, I watch with South Korea and Japan because their rates are exceptionally low and the deaths are exceptionally low over there. Uh, for the workplaces, the top one um, is South Korea. They're not wearing N95s at the workplace in a factory or anything else, but they are wearing, you know, the equivalent of a surgical mask um, or, you know, the cloth mask with our filters type of thing. Uh, they're also wearing gloves, and that's something that hasn't been put into the CDC guideline, but, um, you know, they in the OSHA guidelines, they talk about uh, may include gloves, gowns, masks, and other Things. And this is where you have to conduct a piece, uh, personal protective equipment assessment in your workplace. But uh, this is something, you know, we're all eventually going to have to think about going back to work and how could you do it. Well, again, they've started up a lot of their facilities uh, that are making masks and doing some key uh, components, and the workers are wearing masks and gloves. And I just got to watch uh, Tesla do the same thing with their ventilators, and all the workers uh, in the video were also wearing masks and gloves. Uh, some of the treatment, uh, the hydroxychloroquine has been popular. Uh, it, it had a lot of buzz a couple weeks ago, but, uh, you know, yesterday uh, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, and Michigan set record deaths. So, you know, this is not a, a, a wonder drug. It, it is a part of a treatment that has some success. But, I mean, you know, we, we're, it's been out there for well over a month, and uh, there are, you know, people that are still you know, passing away at record numbers. Uh, some of the things that they're starting to look at, uh, Mount Sinai and a couple other people are looking at, uh, you know, taking the antibiotics of uh, people who are recovered and then possibly put them in uh, critically ill people. Uh, the initial trials that tell who has antibodies that could make us uh, potentially resistant or say you can go back to work is still uh, going through a lot of test uh, uh, phases right now. The, the portable testers have had not uh, good results in the last uh, week that I've seen, so um, they're hoping by, you know, the next few weeks we could get some kind of a tester and see who has antibody, who's been able to fight the disease, and, you know, technically they should have some resistance to it in the future. Uh, one of the things that I saw in China published in the New England Journal of Medicine was 83% of the patients um, were uh, lymphocytopenia, or low white blood cell counts. And that's a pretty stunning number because I thought uh, that's an easy test that anybody could go and get measured. And, 
if you're in a position that your light white blood cell counts are low, you would probably a, a vulnerable population. It seems to be a, an issue. If you have high ones, I, I have a feeling you'd probably be able to fight it off. And you know, I'm not sure if the relationship between age and this uh, um, white blood cell count, but uh, it is interesting to see that is a, a huge number. Other conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and high blood pressure, or excuse me, um, high blood sugar, um, were also you know factors. But this one just uh, was one that I thought was pretty interesting. And of course, uh, the Bronx Zoo had a tiger that came down with it uh, last week, but another cat uh, in Hong Kong got tested. We've already had, uh, you know, a Pomeranian in Hong Kong. So now, again, uh, no symptoms in illnesses of these animals, but they're watching it closely. So it is something that they know can get transmitted or vice versa. One of the questions last week uh, was, or two weeks ago was about the CPAP uh, you know, for those with sleep apnea, I see those used all the time. Um, one of the studies come out, they talk about uh, in London Hospital that uh, uh, it has a good result uh, that, uh, you know, 50% of the patients who had the CPAP avoided the need for the ventilator, which seems to be a, uh, you know, important issue. So, you know, if you're having the shortness of breath, this is uh, something that people are sitting there taking a look at and watching. And, uh you know, just another method that somebody else is going through. Again, you know, there's no um, uh, pure research on this subject right now, but it is something that, you know, you get a hospital and looking at the data between two countries, uh, three countries really, uh, seems to be something to, to watch. And let's go into the uh, OSHA record keeping. That'll be short. Uh, you know, generally OSHA does not count the flu as a recordable injury, but uh, as so, I, I get questions on this every day. Uh, John, I had a quick question for you. I'm hearing rumors if a worker comes down with COVID-19 while at work, is it an OSHA recordable? When we go to the OSHA website, it can be recordable if result of performing the work-related duties. And employers are responsible for recording the case if all the following are met. So there's three criteria. Case is a confirmed case of COVID-19, not, you know, the person has the symptoms of COVID-19. It is work-related, and I'm going to cover after this uh, what they call the high-risk and the medium-risk jobs. So I think if you're obviously in a high-risk or medium-risk job, you'd have to presume it would probably be work-related. If you're low-risk, uh, you could probably make a case that it may not be. Uh, involves one of the reporting criteria. That means there's going to be medical treatment. Uh, Self-isolation is not a treatment, and we're talking about if they're going to get you know, some antibiotics, which are prescription, then that would be a case. If they're going to miss days away from work, uh, that would be a case that would have to go through it. So work-related work is uh, the environment or the workplace contributed or aggravated the uh, illness. And exposure in high-risk operations, you can imagine the medical people that are definitely in this area, anything with health care, doctors, nurses, and uh, hospital staff. Um, I, I've been trying to track the, uh, the amount of uh, people in the healthcare that have died, and I'm over, um, I think at 39 right now, where I can just uh, go through a lot of people. I mean, we're having a lot of people who have already been self-isolated and, and they are sick, uh, but we have had already 39 people pass away uh, from this virus in the healthcare field. Medium exposure risks, uh, you know, this is frequent close contact with uh, the public. So. Today I'm starting to see, or this week I've started to see a lot of these barriers come up between the, the retail uh, establishments. Uh, the Jewel Food Store in my area has finally got uh, people with the mask and the gloves. Um, but this would be a case uh, we, we take a look at. Uh, Evergreen Park had a Walmart where two people have died that were workers there. Uh, Trader Joe's had a death this week uh, with COVID-19. So the medium workplaces that are in high volume retail definitely are going to have exposure and so lower exposure risks this is going to be a lot of employers uh, this is an area where you're not going to be in contact with the general public uh, within six feet of it and you could make a case if there is a COVID it may not be related to work you know and uh, but once you do have it at work you have to start thinking we're going to have to do a deep clean and uh, make sure that people are you know getting the training and the PPE uh, right now, uh, two of the big auto companies, uh, one of them has had seven deaths, one of them has had, I think, four deaths 
at their manufacturing facilities. So again, you know, considering the use of PPE and uh, training and the limitations of uh, what they're using, you have to, you know, say we have to wear this uh, mask and probably even gloves. The surgical mask and the N95, you know, a lot of people, you know, haven't had a lot of experience with these. Uh, first time that people wearing N95 respirators are just given to them and uh, they're surprised that uh, it, it's hot, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's maybe not so comfortable. Uh, the N95 is supposed to be worn with a clean shaven uh, face. You're not supposed to be using this. If it's required to filter out a particle, you're supposed to have a clean shave. Surgical mask is proved by the FDA. It's loose fitting. It's not going to prevent the virus from coming in. It just offers a lot of protection against possibly coughing and going through it. Now, there was a study that just came out um, um, today, I just read, uh, that talked about the uh, surgical mask. Because the particle size is an uh, eighth of a micron and the, the N95 is going to filter out, 0 0.0 microns. The surgical mask has been shown that a person coughing could have the virus expelled through the surgical mask. So that's something, you know, again, I would I I would say maybe, you know, thinking about the, the one with the furnace filter would be a little bit better maybe. The N95 will filter out 95% of the particles that are 0 0.0 microns or 0 0.03 microns or um, or larger. And, uh, you know, again, you have to be trained on wearing it. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, crisscross straps, a lot of straps both from below the ears or above the ears. Uh, you know, so there's got to be training on how to put this on. And I keep on going through the different tests that I've just played with. Uh, the acrylic swarf has passed three times in a row, uh, double wrap for something I did at Target. Now Target's out of them. I went to Target to try to find them, and I couldn't find any more of them. Uh, the furnace filter 1900, uh, you know, they advertise it's going to filter out viruses, and it, and it apparently does good. Uh, the triple layer we tried out first, and I've gotten it passed to a single layer now. Calocious come up with some ones about surgical masks because of the shortage of the N95 uh, respirators. 3M this week said the demand by healthcare is so big that uh, we may not have the capacity in the United States right now for a while to get the masks out to the general public and stuff. So, um, again, the healthcare people are going to get priority and uh, because they're out on the front lines. Uh, but Cal OSHA has some guidelines. If surgical masks are going to be used for lower level tasks, that means you're not going to be handling um, patients with COVID, and, and that's going to be a lot of us at the workplaces. We're not expecting to work with somebody that's uh, sick with COVID. We're going to be in a retail facility or a manufacturing facility or construction site. We can use these kind of masks. Again, uh, employer must make sure they follow in California the state's aerosol transmission disease standard, which is not a bad standard for a lot of people to take a look at if you want to get an idea of what you could do. You got to do a lot of training just like any other standard in OSHA. You have to go over what it can work for. Where is it not going to be good? Because surgical masks, uh, like anything else, can start accumulating the virus on uh, their face. And so reuse is becoming popular. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, you know, uh, for high hazard medical, they're going to sell you that, you know, maybe you ought to go out and get a powered air purifying respirator or uh, some other type of respirators that are available. Cost more money, but, you know, they, you know, if you're in a healthcare situation with, you know, uh, patients that are sick with this virus, you don't want to be using a surgical mask. You want to be wearing a uh, respirator that's going to be able to filter it out. And it said uh, workers should be allowed to wear their own PPE if you can't provide the gear, which has been the shortage by a lot of employees. And um, punishing a worker for bringing a PPE to work um, could be a whistleblower complaint. Uh, the average OSHA office uh, is getting lots of calls. Uh, State of Oregon said 2,000 calls in the first four months. Um, uh, Michigan, OSHA, same thing, 2,000 calls about COVID-19 issues related to work. So this is going to be an issue. And again, uh, you have to think about what works. What we're showing here is a nebulizer with a Bitrex solution. We'll show you what a hood looks like for Bitrex a little bit later. But this is just going to be a strong dose. This would be a lot more than anything you'd ever see in real life. And this is going through the one I just wore um, with the, the furnace uh, filter, and it, and it works fine. You know, it doesn't come through it. Alex is making a seal here just to show that if we're just breathing through the, the main area of the, rest, uh, the, uh, the cloth uh, mask, it does work with uh, 
blocking out the bitrix, which, you know, most of the stuff I'm testing does not work. And, you know, for some reason, there's a person out there making uh, the blue shop towels uh, thing and telling everybody it's the greatest thing in the world. And I've tried both of the blue shop towel brands, and they both failed miserably with Bittrex. So I would not recommend those at all. So OSHA has a lot of rules on respirator requirements. This is where you're going to wear a respirator. It's going to be required for work. You have to develop a written respirator program. If you just type on sample respirator program in your search engine, you'll get a lot of OSHA state plans that will have sample programs. And you can use that and put your company's name. You just got to make sure you're going to talk about the respirators that you have at your facilities and what you're going to do. When we look at overall, what does OSHA expect? Well, they expect the written program. They expect some kind of medical evaluation. Now, these are for the N95s, the face, uh, full face respirators, and other ones. These are not for these surgical masks. These are, you know, for what we call the respiratory protection. So there's got to be some medical evaluation. You know, some people, like they said, when they first started wearing N95s, they, you know, maybe this is going to aggravate pre-existing conditions they may have. So you have to have somebody take a look at this issue. Uh, you got to do fit testing with these. And... Uh, and we'll talk about the, uh, the OSHA rule on uh, health care a little bit later, but everybody else has got to do this. When you give it to them, you have to make sure it fits. Uh, you got to make sure the respirator is good for the exposure, you know, and, um, and, and like I said, you know, if you got other things uh, besides uh, the COVID-19, you got silica or something else, you may not be able to wear just a half mask respirator. And then, you know, keeping it uh, clean uh, and properly storing it, not sharing it is important also. You have to do annual training with respirators and then you gotta evaluate your program every year. Uh, beards are not allowed for um, the, the N95 if, if it's required to protect against the hazard. Now, if you're gonna give voluntary use, there's an OSHA section in 1910-134 called Appendix D and you have to follow those four things uh, for the voluntary use. That means you're giving them a box of respirators. Uh, these are the filtering phase piece respirators and you got to at least cover the manufacturer rules and talk about not sharing it. So the annual fit test uh, for healthcare, it says OSHA will exercise discretion for the healthcare facility. So your hospitals and your um, uh, nursing homes that are doing a lot of this work and they're they're maybe overdue for the annual fit test because of this crisis. Um, as long as they're trying to make a good faith effort to comply with the respirator standard, they're using NIOSH certified respirators. We'll talk about the non-NIOSH certified foreign respirators a little bit later. Um, and, you know, you could possibly get a little waiver on the annual. Now, this doesn't apply for anybody in manufacturing or construction. That's not, didn't go out for all, all sectors. So, in, well, you're going to test with Bittrex. There's different ways. Uh, you can use a nebulizer. Uh, you, there's a, a, I don't call it a puffer, but they're going to wear a hood, and then you're going to go in and you're going to do the, the standard protocols, maybe bend side to side, talk read the rainbow passage and see if this is going to go through. And the hood keeps the Bittrex in suspension, and that's what's going to verify the N95 is going to be used. There's other ones. Uh, you would see 1910-134 Appendix A for how to go through the other ones, like uh, the saccharin solution or uh, sensitivity solution that also be used. The other country respirators. Now, because, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kraft went to China and brought in over a million-plus respirators from China, People are saying, can we use these, uh, you know, foreign filtering paste pieces? It says it's N95 equivalent. And, uh, and the OSHA's recognized that, uh, and, and I put the date of the memo, April 3rd. So you can go and find these on the OSHA site when they're the COVID website period. But Australia, Brazil, China, European Union, Japan, Korea, and Mexico have respirators that they are going to be certified to meet the equivalent of our standards also. Um, these respirators would be considered half mask filtering face pieces. They would have a protection factor greater than 10 or equal to or greater than 10. Um, but with these, you have to be aware of counterfeits. There are a lot of people on the secondary market uh, like eBay and other ones that are selling these respirators and there's not anything that's equivalent to it. When I look at the respirator, there's all plain white. There's not a single label. There's not a single thing that it says anybody's testing. So this could be somebody in another country just making these things out, put making it look good, but it, you don't have any confidence with the work. You know, if they're making them out of a cotton poly blend, it's going to go right through that respirator. It's not going to trap anything. 
The reuse of respirators is in another OSHA memo. It talks about, um, you know, again, these were originally designed to be worn once, and then at the end of the day, you threw them away. Um, and there's some different rules for healthcare, which I'm not going to go into. But uh, some of the workers, you know, you could use it as long as the respirator maintains its structural and functional integrity. Now, when I've worn these things uh, and trying to see how long they would last, uh, you know, you can get uh, maybe 20, 25 hours out of some of these, but eventually that strap is going to break. And that's, you know, really probably time to start thinking about a new respirator if you can get one. Um, and that's why, again, a lot of people like this um, surgical mask when you're not in these high-risk occupations and stuff. Uh, but you got to be conscious that this also on the surface could have the virus, and you have to start thinking about disinfecting and decontamination. But it says employers must adjust in the written respirator program the circumstances when a disposable respirator will be considered contaminated. So that's something new for a lot of people. If you're running a respirator program, you're going to have to alter the written program and talk about this issue. Are you going to allow reuse or not? And when are you going to tell people it's got to be decontaminated and when you're not going to use it any further and stuff? You're going to have to perform a user seal check. And a seal check is uh, very simple to use. 90% um, of the employees I, I talk to have never seen a user seal check. You just put the respirator on. Make sure your head top straps above your ears, lower straps you want it. And you're just going to blow. Now, I get no leakage in the seal. Usually on some respirators, I get a, because I had a broken nose, I'll get a, a leak right through here. Well, that's the positive. Then you take a breath in, and you don't feel the air coming. It's all going through the essentially the mask. So that's a user seal check. That's a very important test. And for me, I use it a lot every day because I've had the broken nose issue and I will have leakage through the nose. So I need to either adjust a respirator or if it's a respirator that cannot fit, um, you're going to go through it. Now, if I was to take the uh, cloth mask and do the same thing, I can do this. It comes right underneath this one here. So I would not have a good seal by just doing the user seal check in the example there. Again, the cloth mask surgical respirators are not equivalent to the N95 respirators. And again, you have to show people how to wear it, uh, make sure they go through it. A lot of people are just putting in, you know, all different ways. And again, uh, if it's going to be N95, you do have to be clean shaven. I have a lot of people with beards that think, well, I'm going to be protected. And it, it could do some protection, but it's not going to be what you need to do. In the memo, it also talks about uh, respirators do have an expiration date. Uh, some of the respirators I look at, they don't have the date marked on them at all. Um, but in this one, like Moldex, they've got it. It's good till you know June 2028. So that's a long time. Um, but you know, OSHA compliance officers are called COSHOs. That's C H C S H O should exercise discretion if they're using beyond the shelf life, including the surgical. N95, so I don't like that term myself. And again, in healthcare, um, they're not going to let you use the expired ones. You know, they want you to use the, the right ones, and uh, they should have the um, the proper equipment. Now, we've had a lot of people uh, come out in the media talk about they don't have the equipment; they're short. Uh, I've seen uh, Illinois, I've seen Ohio, uh, where the different uh, hospitals have asked for anybody who's got them from. EMT, I watched Lindenwood College in Missouri just donate a whole bunch of uh, respirators and gloves to the hospitals because their, you know, paramedic uh, care program has stopped because the school is closed for right now. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of that done, and that's just a temporary solution until we can get more of these out to the healthcare people. Again, we talked about the written program. Um, I don't see OSHA coming out on uh, most of these complaints unless there's a you know a signed signature I expect them to call most employers up uh, but they would probably ask for as part of the whole uh, uh, phone call or the, what they call the uh, um, inspection process or is that they might want to see a respirator program so you're going to have to have one and you have to have train people in it and show proof of that training and again you're going to provide different types of respirators to the level of exposure and stuff um, you know, there's ones that are full face piece like this. Uh, these are good for possibly a protection factor of 100 or higher. It depends on if you do, you know, different tests. 
Uh, other ones, you know, where you can have a hood with a powered air purifying, other solutions you can use. Again, you know, we talk about, um, you know, you don't use these air purifying respirators when you're doing blasting or firefighting and with facial hair and stuff. So they have to be approved for the use that they're using it. And some other things, we don't want to sit there, you know, when we take a look at the respirator, if it's dirty inside, uh, one of the things you want to look for is the seal. Is that cracked? Is it already gone? Is the respirator dirty? Is it just stored in a box somewhere or a locker? Uh, common use is not very good. It's supposed to be cleaned every night or disinfected, whatever the manufacturer uh, tells you, but it should be, you know, at least washed and sanitized at the end of the day for these cartridge respirators. And then there's these other respirators that look like a respirator, but uh, they're sold. I mean, these are sold for like 20 cents a piece, and uh, these are just essentially just uh, looks like a cloth, but it, it is the, the, this company here, A.O. Smith, or A.O. Safety, I'm sorry, not A.O. Smith, says this mask is not a respirator. It doesn't provide any protection, and it just looks good, and you think you're okay, but it won't really protect against anything. So it's kind of like maybe a, a lower-grade surgical mask if at best. You know, when you do a user seal check with this, it'll come out all different sizes a lot of times. You can get other respirators. A lot of people see these numbers, you know, uh, P100, which should filter out 100% uh, of the uh, particles, 0.3 microns and there and stuff. And uh, you got to tell people, you know, when you choose the respirator, you got to think about what, what their exposure is. What You have to make that assessment and, you know, deciding what the PPE is going to be for that worker in that workplace. So again, you know, this is only made for one user. There should be no reason whatsoever to share one of these uh, filtering phase pieces. Um, they used to design them for a lot of times just eight hours of maximum use, and this is where people are, you know, OSHA's, you know, according to the memo, you can reuse them. And uh, but a lot of places, like I said, uh, they're finding out, you know, you can get a couple days, three days, maybe on it, and then something will break on it, and your spouse will probably go in there. So I've got, you know, particularly the retail stores start out with some of these and then next thing you know they're out of them and they're going back to the uh, you know the uh, homemade cloth ones and stuff again half mask is good uh, there is seems to be no shortage of the half mask when I go out there and you can go over here and you can get half masks over 35 bucks I mean this is almost every store has it. it's just people that say well I don't want to wear this because it's hot it's going to be sweating but this is like a P95 and P means partially resistant to oil um, it's going to be one that can filter out aerosols in this case, as well as the solid particles. So uh, there is plenty of those available, and those cartridges can be uh, reused uh, or used until you know you start to have some you know clogging of it due to you know enough dust. But a lot of the stuff you know you clean it, sanitize it at the end of the day, and uh, you're ready to go tomorrow. And you know I tell people just put it in a big Ziploc gallon bag and. That's a good way to, you know, once it's dry, to keep it, uh, you know, from getting any contamination on it. So the fit test, like I said, uh, you know, you're going to do an annual one for the um, person wearing it. You're talking about the user seal check. They have to make sure they're going to wear it. There's lots of videos, including this one from OSHA, that's on the web. But you can go out and uh, make sure people know how to use it. And this is important because this will catch if there's any kind of leakage on your N95 respirator. Uh, when you go through the uh, respirator, they have to be told how to inspect it. I mean, obviously, um, this one's got a broken strap at the bottom, and people say, well, I still can wear it. Well, that's not going to work anymore. The strap is there to keep a con constant seal, and the minute you move your face, it's going to create a leakage and stuff. So you got to tell people that this, this is not something you probably can fix, you know, and just think about getting a new respirator. There's other ones that are still available out there. There's, uh, you know, powered air purifiers. What they do is the yellow device is sucking in the air, forcing it in through the full face piece uh, uh, respirator, full face respirator, and, and it's nice. The hood one that's on the far right is what I used to wear, and it's very nice. It's, it gets uh, the air coming in, and if you're in a hot environment, it's kind of nice. And, and, they didn't, and they're treated now. They don't fog up at all, and it's cooler air, so kind of nice in the summertime. The training has to be done prior to use, uh, so you can't just, you know, give them a box and then say we got training coming up two weeks from now. Um, and then we talked about it will be done annually. And again, if you're giving them a, uh, the filtering face piece, you could do it as a voluntary basis. 
Now, if your PPE hazard assessment says, no, we're in high volume retail, we would need to sit there and have this be warned, then you'd have to require this to be done for training as well as to fit tests. So, you know, a lot of the, the voluntary use, they're going to tell them, you know, follow Appendix D, read the instructions, don't share your respirator, don't wear your respirator in environments with low oxygen, and uh, pretty simple ones. There's a lot of different versions of this. Um, you always got to look at it. Is there going to be facial hair? That's one of the things, you know, in the top 10 cited items by OSHA. Medical evaluation. That means you're going to fill out an evaluation, and the standard has uh, examples in the uh, the appendix. It talks about what they're going to ask. I always say it's a list of uh, several questions. Do you have emphysema, lung cancer, other issues? And, and that medical professional can evaluate this and, and say, if there's something I need to listen to your lungs, see if there's an issue. Um, and there are online versions of this, too. Uh, 3M has got one, and uh, some people have used that. But this is not an expensive test uh, or an exam. It's just uh, something that you want to make sure that people are not going to have an aggravated condition by just wearing a respirator. Now, the stannic chloride, uh, I like it because uh, you don't you don't can't really fake it. You know, you can always say, I don't taste the Bistrix or the saccharin and stuff. But this was really designed for the uh, P100 series. Um, and it says only the standard chloride smoke tube shall be used for this protocol, and you don't need to wear it now. We're just testing the P100 full face, and you know, if he if he's going in and he going through the test and he goes through the different uh, protocols, bend in side to side, bend up and down, and things like this, it's pretty good. Um, I always tell people a positive test is good for irritant smoke, and negative on this one would be bad. But if you're doing a negative on a uh, P95, then I would say we'd want to use Bitrick or Saccharin. Uh, the loose fitting uh, powered air purifiers don't need this fit test because they're going to be powering the air through there. And now you can also do things that are qualitative or, or, or quantitative that are going to give you a number. Uh, when I used to wear a half mask, uh, OSHA used a corn oil test and, you know, and put the hood in there and measured the uh, respirator inside and outside air for corn oil. And I could get about 10,000 uh, fit factor on my uh, north half mask respirator. So this is the difference. The quantitative gives you a number. It tells you how good that fit factor is. Normally, a half mask is good for a factor of 10. And if you got uh, something that gets you 1,000, that's pretty good. But again, different respirators fit different people because their faces are all different. So you know, if a north respirator gives you maybe 100, you might find another one like 3M or Moldex or somebody else may give you a higher number. So it is something that uh, you can go through. And it's, again, easy one to use. Again, um, the qualitative, uh, you know, even though it looks like this is going to give you a number, it's just telling you, can you test the Bitrex or Saccharin uh, qualitative? Uh, the uh, smoke, uh, or excuse me, the Bitrex is about 3 or $4 a tube. So you have to start thinking. you got 100 employees. You're going to have to buy a lot of tubes if you're going to go through this. The nebulizer, uh, for what I use is the nebulizer in this, um, it's one per person. So it's not going to be something that's going to be, you know, used a whole bunch of them with just one little tube. User seal check, again, you know, there's going to be manufacturers who always have this in their instructions, but essentially you're going to block the cartridges just like I did with the filtering face piece. It's going to be the cartridges instead and then cover the, you know, exhalation valve and try to make sure it's seated. And again, this is an important step. 90% of the workers I that I see wearing this have never been shown this. And this is important because this is how you know the respirator is going to be good for you. Different ones, again, we just did the uh, user seal check for the uh, positive pressure and negative pressure. This one, again, OSHA has videos on this under the respirator standard page. And there's plenty of them online by the manufacturers also. Employees have responsibility also. They have to make sure, you know, there's no provision that OSHA is going to find the employees, and it's not the case. But, you know, they've got to make sure that this respirator is, is going to be worn and it's sanitary. So, you know, once you've trained the people, you've got to show them how to clean this respirator. They just can't take it and throw it in there. You can see in this case, you know, the red dust is everywhere inside. So not going to be a good seal. It's not going to be clean and um, not allowed. In the pre protocol, you know, they talk about washing it and rinsing it and draining and sanitizing it. 
Uh, there's different solutions, and you know, there's manufactured cleaners that I like a lot, and you know, there's different ones. You you know, you're gonna go out and clean it, and it's gonna take it apart and and let it dry. So it's not like it's you know, you throw it in the bag and you're done for the day. You have to clean this thing. And again, you know, uh, once it's dry, you don't want to put it in the bag when it's wet because it'll just you know, it'll all be you know, humid and everything else. But you want to protect it against any kind of uh, dust that's in the air, and particularly the virus itself. You know. Decontamination. Now, there's, you know, misters. You can go out and buy misters of any kind of thing that goes through it. Uh, there's a lot of what they call uh, 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 manufacturers who sell decontamination solutions. Um, you know, they're talking about decontaminating the N95s. Uh, Battelle's got this device that can decontaminate thousands at a time now. Uh, and these are places that are going to be high volume use and stuff. Uh, Duke University, uh, in the references in the study in the notes section, um, found out hydrogen peroxide uh, could uh, be done several times. But as you do this over and over, the elastic strap will degrade and eventually break also. Um, and again, decontamination for the areas, you know, cleaning staff should clean and defect all areas such as office, bathrooms, common areas, shared electronic equipment, tablets keyboards and remotes. And again, uh, this is not where you're going to spray liquids. This is where you're probably going to have to get some of these wipes that are antibacterial wipes for your electronic equipment and stuff. Um, again, you know, the uh, the people that are in healthcare handling COVID, they should know the rules about, you know, ventilation and making sure that the, you know, the, the virus is not getting brought into the hallway, that it's not going to be a common area that the, the ventilation is pumping into. Life on the surface. Uh, this week, uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, kind of came up with some numbers. It can live quite a bit. Uh, aerosol in the air, three hours, up to four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard, which is your boxes, and then two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. Um, I have no idea why copper doesn't uh, um, have a, a life on it, but these are things that, you know, I have people, you know, decontaminating packages. And, and this is because cardboard, it could be up to 24 hours if the virus is in there. So I'm watching the delivery services now all starting to wear gloves and masks and trying to make sure that they're uh, not getting contaminated themselves because uh, two of the services had uh, people die. The post offices had several people die. Um, and this is an issue of, you know, it is going to be, possibly transmitted on that surface. In construction, uh, there was uh, Nevada came out first uh, with some guidelines. Uh, they talked about uh, no more than 10 people, uh, the social distancing is six feet, uh, less than um, 10 total working at the area where you're going to get together, and then make sure we have ability to, you know, uh, sanitation and uh, cleaning supplies. And they talked about um, Make sure you check the people every day. You know, and they didn't talk about scanners. Said may include temperature scans and in-person Q and A. You know, um, make sure they got the proper equipment and, and water. And then, um, if they're at a site uh, with 50 people, what do you do if one person tests positive? Well, again, I would sit there and you know start going a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, Los Angeles came out uh, two days ago, and uh, I just got the instructions today. They gave uh, 13 guidelines recommendations for construction, and if you don't follow these, these could result in uh, Los Angeles shutting down that facility's uh, construction site. But uh, very similar, they have a couple other things. It says provide protective equipment such as gloves, goggles, face shields, masks as appropriate. Uh, you will have a site-specific COVID-19 supervisor to enforce this. You'll identify choke points or high-risk areas where workers are forced to stand together, such as hallways, hoists, and elevators. Minimize the interaction when picking up delivery equipment to ensure six-foot um, separation. And then stagger the trades to reduce the density in the workplace. And then discourage workers from using other phones and desks. So I found this by typing in Los Angeles COVID-19 construction uh, guidance, and then I found that on the Internet. Some of the EPA defectants, again, not every EPA defectant uh, you can just put on there and wipe. 
you have to follow what the uh, guidance from the manufacturer. So what I have, and there's just a list. If you just type in EPA uh, disinfectants virus, you'll get a huge long list. It's also in the notes section. But hydrogen peroxide uh, proxy home, it takes a 10-minute soak time on it. Um, Champion spray on disinfectant, 10 minutes. Uh, phenolic ethanol concept hospital disinfectant, 10 minutes. Hydrogen peroxide by H2O2, five minutes. Sodium hypochloride, which is your bleach dispatch, that's what it looks like, the, the photo there, one minute. So, you know, this idea that I see in the cleaning things, a lot of times they just spray wipe and then that's it. And that's not going to be good enough to really kill the virus in a deep clean. You have to make sure the cleaning people understand this uh, is the manufacturer has some guidance on, you know, how long it has to sit or soak. And any questions? Uh, some of the ones I saw, i just uh, give you an example. The coffee filter one um, I saw several times. I saw it in my town. People think, well, it filters out coffee, filters out the virus. It's worthless. It goes right through. The Vitrix is going right through it. Same thing as Debra. You know, they're thinking, well, it's good. Anything that's cotton polyester is not going to be good. This one had some spandex in it. It didn't make a difference. It goes right through it. So uh, PD's got a list of the questions. Uh, let's go through some of these. Should essential workers working with other employees inside of social distance be required to wear a face mask? Well, when you look at the hospitals, they are. They are all wearing N95 respirators. You know, again, you know, you got to start thinking about you're going to be right next to people. Um, with COVID, you got to wear it. Now, let's say you're in a high-volume retail store. What we're seeing now is uh, the, uh, the plexiglass screens, people wearing the masks. Um, I, you know, the, the guidance is right now is to wear a mask. And if you go to South Korea and Japan, which have the lowest two incident rates, that's what they're all wearing. They're, they're, you know, I can see the day where you're not going to be able to go to the store without a mask on. Uh, what about CDC recommendations? Avoid contact uh, as 10 to 13 minutes. Uh, keep contact less than 10 minutes. Uh, that one I'd have to go look at. I, I don't remember seeing a, a time on it. You know. Um, the issue is, you know, you think about it, how much do you have to get to the person before you develop it? That's that's data we really don't know. Um, again, um, anything you can do to, to go through it. I mean, there's certain jobs you cannot, um, you know, avoid personal contact, particularly in the healthcare. But if you're at a bank, you can have a lot of stuff done through the drive up. You don't have to have the people at the window anymore. Uh, but again, I tell people, you know, if you're going to be in that six foot zone and you're going to be right next to a person, you know, the gloves and the, the mask should be worn. Would manufacturing be considered medium risk? Uh, you can make a case for low risk or medium risk, uh, depending on where you're at. I've been to enough facilities that, uh, you know, you can keep six-foot distance, particularly on the assembly lines and everything else. People working in their cells, they're not there, you know, and a lot of the stuff, you just have to go through it. Again, why not wear the mask? Why not wear the gloves? Is N95 for one use? That's what they originally designed it for. Now, OSHA's got guidance on reuse of the respirator, so that's what I just covered, and you want to follow those guidelines. The manufacturers have not uh, got on board with this. This is something they didn't expect, but we're having a shortage right now, and your answer is to throw the respirator that's good and not wear anything or go to the cloth mask, or can I use this and be kind of safe? Um, will, you review, will you be reviewing covering the recently published guidelines from yesterday Covering all buildings, businesses such as health, as healthcare. Um, no, because I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't see it. So this is the trouble right now is that you're getting so much information coming out. Um, I saw some other issues, and you know it was general language, you know, but I, I don't know what the uh, specific guideline was in it. You have the photos of the 3M furnace filter. Well, if you ever get a furnace filter, it's going to be uh, this. An accordion shape. It's going to be in a, a cardboard frame with like a, a like a wire mesh. So you just take out the cardboard frame. You take out the wire mesh. Now this has been cut, and you can just take now the uh, the fabric. I haven't seen it sold by the roll yet, but uh, you know it's it's like ten dollars for a, you know a two by two, and that's a lot of you know fabric and stuff. Does the 3M furnace filter have glass fiber? I, it's synthetic fiber. It's not to my knowledge, glass fiber. Again, with the New York Times uh, study, they recommended that you cannot be putting the bare filter against your face because you would inhale those fibers. 
and we don't know what the effect on it. So they would recommend if you use a cloth that could filter it out. <clears throat> Can you comment on the USP and FDA requiring do not use after 30 days from production date of hand sanitizers uh, made to who formulation by distilleries? Um, no, I, I really haven't seen uh, the thing. Let's take a look at this. The 30 days, it's got an FDA number on here. Um, let's see if it has a expiration. I don't see any expiration date on this. So that's a good question. Um, I would think alcohol and hydrogen peroxide would not be an issue. But again, um, you know, 30 days is, uh, I, I think you can, if you manage it, you could, uh, if you're using it, uh, you should be able to get all of it done within 30 days. Again, this is something, you know, that's uh, that we haven't seen. How long can isopropyl alcohol or sanitizers last? You know, I mean, what's the basis of putting on the expiration date? Is it something they've done tests on, or is it just some number that they said, well, let's give it 30 days? Uh, the gloves, uh, nitro gloves is what I see the most. If you go to the hospitals, they all wear the nitro. Uh, latex causes a lot of times allergies among people, so they don't. You know, latex you could use, but there's people who are very sensitive and break out on a rash on it. Um, for for the non six foot contact ones, I mean, I I'm, I'm going to say I like this. I can go in here. I can wear these gloves. They're comfortable. They're vented. Um, I don't ever anticipate the backside to be touched. Now I disinfected these earlier. But you go out and you can take these cloths and you can go over here. So when you got to go out there and you do the work, clean it before you use it, clean it after you use it. It's cheap. Uh, and you don't have to re you can reuse this because this nitro is very strong. This is going to be coated. It's comfortable. I think it's it's a it's a, it's not you know there's not a guidance on it. Again, nothing in OSHA right now says that you have to wear the gloves. It says you have to go. Um, um, follow what the, uh, the guidance is, and it says you have to make the assessment. You have to decide it. But I'm going to go to South Korea and Japan. They're wearing the gloves, and that's what I think everybody else should be starting thinking about, too. Uh, OSHA, a few minutes ago, released a memo extending the fit test compliance to all industries. Well, that's good. And uh, there's a printed memo dated April 8th. See? This is how fast this information comes. Uh, April 8th, uh, Patrick uh, Kappas said uh, temporary enforcement guidance. Uh, so it's going to be on the COVID website uh, uh, site. Um, the March 14th guideline, which applied to health care. Um, OSHA offices will exercise enforcement discretion in inserting the annual fit test requirement. So there we are. Um, now they're saying, apparently, further given the concern regarding shortage of fit, te fit testing kits and test solutions, such as Bitrix, ISO um they should prioritize the use of fit testing equipment to protect employees who must use the respirator for high hazard procedures. So it's a definitely a, an interesting memo to take a look like. But uh, what I'm going to guess real quick without um, digging into it is that the, the annual fit test could be given some leeway, you know. But got to remember, they are getting thousands of questions in each state on COVID, and um, I can imagine this is going to be a, an issue for them. I, I, they're not doing the inspections to the, one, the people I've talked to. They're trying to call the employer up and say, what's your program, what's your hazard assessment, and then work with them that way. They don't, you know, and that's a good thing because you know, it's it's, it's uh, for a lot of employers are saying, I'm not sure what I got exactly do, and you know, I'm getting this call. Hello, this is OSHA. We understand employees don't have any gloves or masks. Well, you know, they're trying to work with the employers because exhalation is not filtered on uh, respirators and uh, surgical masks. Uh, do they protect employees? Well, if you look at the one article um, that I read uh, the other day. Um, they talked about the density that the surgical masks, uh, because of the particle virus is 0.125 microns, and the N95 is designed for 0.3, so the COVID particle is smaller, 
they're finding out it will exhale through a surgical mask. And that's why they recommended possibly a cloth mask with a furnace filter, uh, the 1900. So that's, again, the New York Times article is in there because they're really taking a look at this issue is if they're coughing and, the, and that's a symptom of COVID, is this mask going to come right through the surgical mask? And the answer is probably yes. Can banana oil be used for qualitative fit testing in respirators? For vapor respirators, that's sure. Again, there's an Appendix A that talks about this. Um, you know, you take whoever you're buying this, the, the, the equipment from, uh, just follow their recommendations. You know, they're going to have a lot of things that are going to be uh, that you have to go in there. But uh, you know, for for this one here, you want to test the uh, the aerosol absorption compound. Banana oil will be fine for this. You know. It seems very risky to have multiple people using the fit testing hood. Is it possible to decontaminate the hood between use? Well, I would definitely decontaminate it. I would wipe it down after every use because you're going to have everybody wear the same thing. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of OSHA people do not like the fact that I just stick the nebulizer right up there, getting somebody like 10,000 times worst case scenario into their breathing zone. I, I think... Uh, you know, I just have done this for a long time. I think it gives the worst case. You can see if it's going to break through or not. And if it can stop that, as well as stannic chloride, I think it's got a potential in there. So I would always decontaminate the hue between use. Aerosol up to three hours. Someone can cough and it can remain in that area for three hours. Technically, the, vet, the, the droplets have been documented to be in the air. You know, and uh, that's, that's an interesting thing. So you think about a, a retail establishment. That particle's in there, and that's where we talk about maybe having these masks. Massachusetts issued guidelines for construction. I knew New York did something. I haven't seen the New York guidelines. I got uh, uh, something uh, that somebody just said they're very similar. I think New York had um, a couple other things, uh, more with sanitizer and running water. I haven't seen the Massachusetts guidelines. Again, every day I'm getting 12 to 25 pages of information, and it's, you know, it's four or five hours a day just looking at it. If you're in a medium risk like a big box store cashier, must your employer supply masks and make it mandatory? Well, there's your big enforcement question. The, the issue is you've got to do a personal protective equipment hazard assessment. I would say yes. The people are working in there. They're working in the aisles. You've got to give a mask. The employer's got to pay for these masks. And the question that I get back from the employer is, is I can't buy the mask. What do you want me to do? Well, then you've got to get employees to have something. You know, and this is where, like I said, I've got construction companies. I've got Jewel Food Store. Uh, Walmart has told me that they they are going to start to get this in their stores yet. I haven't seen it in my local area, but you got to have these people because there are people dying in the retail establishments from COVID-19, and you know, and the odds are they got it from work. You know, so um, I would say yes, mask, and I also would push gloves. And again, because the product, anything you're handling. It could live on that surface for an hour to sometimes, if it's metal, four days. Return to work plans once it's all settled. Um, you know, eventually we're going to get this antibody test. We'll know who's got it or, and passed it and got immune systems or who's infectious or not. I mean, I've got uh, some of these uh, expensive companies. They can test people every day, but that's, that's beyond the resources for a lot of people and a lot of companies. Um, what are Duke decontaminated? Well, first of all, when you're going to decontaminate, we know what surfaces that people touch. We've got to decontaminate. It's got to be done right. You just can't wipe for five seconds and say it's good. You've got to follow what the manufacturer's uh, chemical says for soak time. So typically you clean it and then you disinfect it. And, you know, that's where we go through it. So a lot of times people just say, well, I just got a paper towel and I spray the disinfectant or isopropyl and I wipe it. Well, that's good for your hands, but it's not necessarily good for the... Uh, the surface. So I tell people get get a registered disinfectant. They're plentiful. They're, to my knowledge, I haven't seen these being in short supply. Now people said uh, soap and water kills virus. That is still appropriate. That's what they still recommend in the CDs. You wash your hands. It, you know, apparently it's an easy virus to kill. How can you determine if it was related to work? Well, that's the million dollar question. You know, you think about one of the big audio facilities having seven deaths at their facilities in the last two weeks. Are these all work-related fatalities that required them to call OSHA? I would say yes. You know, maybe the first time, maybe, maybe not. 
you know, and again, the employer has a result uh, if the medical professional are, says it's not work-related, the employer can rely on that result. I would have to say if you're in a medium risk or high risk, you have to consider it probably recordable. If you're in a low risk, you know, you're an attorney office and, you know, you're keeping the distance and you're doing a lot of this stuff, I would say probably no, you know. But once you get somebody with positive, let's say, and I'm going to pick on the, uh, uh, you know, an office like an attorney or something, then you've got to do the cleaning. And after 14 days, you don't get another case, you probably can say it wasn't related again. But otherwise, you know, you get next day, you get somebody else who gets COVID, then you'd have to say it'd be a work-related case. This is very controversial. You have to remember, you know, we gone from a case where, we, you know, even with the uh, avian flu and stuff, this was not going to be uh, an issue, and now it is. So um, can you please, which Ferner filter? I've tested the 3M 1900. The New York Times used the 1900 series. That's the designation of the, uh, the density of the filter to f filter out like viruses. HEPA vacuum bags, I haven't checked, so I don't know if they would work. Um, you know, I, I, the reason I, I, I picked the, the furnace filter was that, you know, they, they specifically say virus on it. You know, we'll filter out viruses and stuff. Um, the HEPA bags, I can't remember seeing that. I got a HEPA vacuum, but I don't remember the bag saying it'll filter out viruses, you know. But... Uh, Again, you know, that's something I would have to read. I could I could check on it and I would test on it. Will employees need to have COVID-19 testing before it's considered a diagnosis? No. Right now, there's nothing that's required. First of all, you can't get the test anyway, at least right now, unless you're, you know, in an age group or you have some symptoms and stuff. You know, I mean, I, I saw Abbott Lab have their, you know, simple five-minute test that they can get the, to tell you if you're positive and it's 13 or so minutes to show a negative. But, uh, you know, that's not readily available. You just can't order that and have your company get this right away. So we're going to have to have, uh, you know, people who start looking at the symptoms and stuff. Uh, again, the PPE is going to be our, our, you know, protection for, for a lot of low or medium risk workplaces, you know, and again, we want to talk about it. The training has got to be done with it. We got to talk about the limitation. You know, people have to know what the masks are. Eventually, you know, I got to believe uh, with other countries, you know, making these N95 masks or equivalent, we will be able to buy them pretty readily in the next few months. Close contact, surgical masks, N95 safety glasses and gloves. Well, if you're in healthcare, yes, all of those. That's what they all wear. Um, if you're in close contact, um, you know, with the public and they're wearing masks and you're wearing masks and gloves, um, I don't know about the safety glasses. Now, if they're just wearing a bandana and they're hacking, you know it can go into the eyes. So that's where you might want to think about it, your hazard assessment. Do I need to possibly wear uh, goggles or some glasses or something? Uh, I, I have recommended if you can keep the safe distance of six feet or social distancing of six feet, the, the masks and the gloves will work, you know, because you're not handling patients with this virus. Okay. Custodial people, the guidance um, working in and around isolation quarantine, N95 is required. Uh, that's been an interesting issue. You know, I got to believe the virus is going to be in the air, so I would think you would want to wear it. Um, I've had other guidance I've seen that talk about you don't necessarily have to have it. You're not handling the patient. The question is, if it lives in the air three hours, we've had cleaning people pass away from this. So were they wearing the mask for protection? I don't know. That's the issue. So you got to start thinking in your hazard assessment, could this virus be inhaled by our cleaning people? And the answer is yes. Then what do you got to wear? You got to wear N95. Has it been confirmed people can get affected from surfaces or is this a theory now? Well, the issue is people come down with these symptoms and we can't place anybody that has had contact with somebody who's known. They've just developed it. Now, this could be the community carrier. It could be a button. We don't know. Again, the, the, the data shows the virus can live on surfaces for four days, like stainless. Uh, when they went to the Carnival Cruise Line, the CDC found the virus alive after 17 days. So, you know, you get the virus on your hands, you touch your face, your mouth, you know, you're possibly asking for an exposure. So it's not a theory. It's, it's, it's a recognized transmission mean. Would safety glasses or any eyewear be required 
enter the virus. Again, they haven't required everybody to wear goggles. Right now, goggles are in a short supply. Um, and so I would think, like I said, you got people in the, the proper uh, masks and the gloves. Hopefully, we're not going to be touching our eyes. We do proper sanitation, hand washing, and all these other things. We should be okay. I'm not clear on the need of gloves versus hand washing recommendation. Okay, well, you know, like I said, I try to tell people, you know, when you're, if, if I'm going to work in a factory, I want to wash my hands before I start work. I'm going to put on my gloves that are clean, uh, disinfect my gloves, go out and do my work. Now I'm going to come in and take my break. I'm going to wash my hands again, disinfect my gloves, put them back on, go back out to work. I'm going to do this again for lunch. I'm going to disinfect my gloves, going to wash my hands. Again, we're just trying to get rid of this issue of, uh, you know, eating and uh, possibly getting the virus, you know, through the issue. You know, it's a uh, lot of studies show that the virus present in the fecal materials. So, um, um, it is something that, you know, ingestion is an issue that it could go into the air passages once it's in your throat. Does the risk factor trigger an OSHA requirement to provide COVID-19 recommended PPE? I think if you're in a medium risk factor, you have to have something. It'd be pretty, you know, like high volume retail, all we have to do is look at how many people have died from the different stores. You know, we had two people in the Walgreens, uh, I mean, Evergreen Park, Walmart die. We've had distribution center people die. You know, this is, this is clearly uh, related to the work. You know, to say these are all community carriers is not really looking at the, the data. Um, and you gotta look what other companies are doing. They're wearing the masks, they're wearing the gloves. I don't work in the medical field, but I work with several other staffs. Which recommend? Then, are you keeping the safe distance? I would wear at least the uh, surgical mask or the the cloth mask with the you know the furnace filter type of thing. Uh, you're not working close to them. Um, you're not in the medical field. The transmission is going to be a low risk. Can your site use a combination of respiratory program and have volunteer program? Well, they use that all the time in a lot of places. There's going to be sparks where you're going to have to wear it in parts that you don't have to wear. That's where you're going to make that assessment as a safety person for your company. Um, again, if you do get this respirator and you want to make it voluntary, that doesn't work. That's only good for the filtering face piece respirator. So this one you can make voluntary, the other one you cannot. And again, you would follow Appendix D, you document your training with it. Can the furnace filter be washed? You can be decontaminated. I, I, you know, again, this is a new area, so um, it's a glass fiber. You can test it after you washed it, but I don't see it. Like I said, you know, I'm going to go over this. You, you know, people are saying, well, you could put this in the washer. Sure. You know, next testing would be let's let's try it again. Let's see if it it did lost its properties after a wash. You know, because I can imagine somebody put this on ultra hot and you know throw bleach in there and and tie detergent. Maybe it won't work. You know, this is an area we don't know about. All right, uh, let's go through some other ones that just came out. Massachusetts uh, guidance on construction. Uh, they call it enforcement of the COVID-19 safety guidelines for construction sites at mass.gov. Uh, safely secure to site pause construction until you have a corrective action plan. Submitted. Approved by the owner and that city. Well, that's a different one. Approved by the city. Um, closed down site for duration. If repeatedly found by the owner's COVID-19 officer or inspector to be in violation of social distancing and safe concrete requirement. Um, they may require site-specific uh, risk analysis. You're going to have a person train. You know, it's almost like a competent person for COVID. You know, it's kind of like the silicon competent person. And then you're going to have a modification of your safety plan that a daily report to the owner representative what you're doing. And um, it's 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 kind of kind of uh, uh, really putting the owner uh, on the construction site to really develop a plan. You know, now when you pour concrete, you're going to have people right next to each other. To me, you're going to wear the mask and gloves. That's not a big deal in that industry anyway. I mean, they wear them all the time, so. I think, you know, like I said, you, you can sit there and say, listen, our transmission is going to be low because we're all wearing the N95 masks and we're all wearing the gloves and stuff. The Another one, enforcement of the COVID-19 safety guidelines for construction sites. Um, 
Oh, that was this one I just read. I'm sorry. And then uh, the New York Times article uh, I referenced. Uh, what's the best material for a mask for coronavirus? That's the uh, came out four um, April 9th. That's interesting. I, I had I saw this earlier. I don't know why, but uh, they tested uh, the air filters. Uh, the allergen reduction worked the best. That was in 1900. Uh, 80, 89 percent of the particles were captured with just a single layer. So that's pretty good. Um, again, the problem with air filters, you can in inhale the small fibers that would be risky, possibly. So if you want to use the filter, sandwich it between two layers of cotton fabric, as we talked about two, two weeks ago. And CDC has some videos on how to make a mask uh, and layering it and everything else. And we're going to cover uh, about three more, four more questions then. If you wash the mask with a furnace filter, is it still effective? Well, nobody's done that test yet. So um, we would have to see. You know, you could test it with a, a Bitrix or uh, other solution tests. Do you recommend respirators for janitors cleaning high volume retail establishments? Um, we've had the, the medical ones going through. This is where you're going to make the risk assessment. Right now, the, the, the guidance is no. You don't have to have them in an N95. If this is, you know, with the gloves they're going to wear, and the disinfectants, you know, they're going through. Now, this issue becomes an issue because if we know it's in the air for three hours, are the janitors going to be exposed? And, and, and this is where people are going to start looking. And this, this easily could change. I would say you at least have to have some masks on. Uh, does it have to be N95? Right now, there's not enough N95 for the cleaning side. So I would get a surgical mask or the cloth mask with the filter, uh, furnace filter and stuff. Um, that's, that's all we can do right now. I mean, uh, if OSHA wants to come out or somebody else wants to come out and says, no, we're going to require to wear, you know, the, the half mask respirator, which is easily available for 35 bucks, then that could be a big change. This is, you know, again, the right now, the current guidance does not require an N95 for cleaning this retail side. Doesn't mean it won't change. Do you need to report hospitalizations of COVID-19 cases? Well, OSHA requires if there is a hospitalization and it meets those three criteria, you have to call 1-800-321-OSHA and report this one. Uh, since incubation, intubation periods are 1 to 14 days, it'd be more than 24-hour post-exposure, I would think not. Well, that's an interesting uh, idea on that one. Where are you getting your half mass respirators? You can get them from Granger. I bought mine at Lowe's. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't seen the shortage. Maybe somebody else is starting to see the shortage. Uh, but I, I found it fairly plentiful. But yeah, again, OSHA talks about uh, uh, you do have to report it if it's in there. And after 24 hours in the illness, or I think it's 30 days, you'd have to, you don't have to report it if it's related after 30 days. But again, if somebody comes down with it, the date of diagnosis, you know, we would say, yeah, I'd have to probably report it. Um, is there a sample infectious disease prevention program for manufacturing? Uh, there's a California uh, version that I would say under Cal OSHA consultation should have it. If employee requests to use their own respirator, is the employer required to fit test? Well, yes, because you have to make sure it's right. Now, we're talking an N95. They got their own box of N95s. Um, now, you can make it voluntary use because you're in a, a low-risk area. Uh, this becomes this whole issue is that, okay, your hazard assessment, because your medium-risk, high-volume retail says, yes, they have to wear an N95. Then you're going to wear it. You're going to pay for it. You're going to test it. You want to make that assessment, and you say, no, we've got the uh, cloth respirators with the furnace filters. We've got the um, surgical masks. We make it voluntary, or we're making it mandatory they got to wear those. Um, that'd be a little bit different. So this really puts a lot of onus on you. And again, the stuff is changing as we start looking at the data from the fatalities and who's getting sick. Uh, you know, 41 uh, New York metropolitan transit workers have died from the virus. And, you know, you would have said, well, the people that are working in that system don't need to wear it because they're not really dealing with the public. They go and clean the trains. They're, they're out there. 
but you know they're within six feet of the public and they're getting it and how are they getting it is it through their hot salts that are in the air are they getting from the surfaces that people are touching on the trains 41 is a lot of people I mean that's an incredible amount uh, let's see and then uh, last thing we'll talk about you'll get a link uh, uh, Monday uh, you should uh, be able to see the, the video on it again uh, this is um, in construction the half face has been in demand the filters are harder to find thank you John that that is uh, that I, I I could believe that um, you know I always tell people if you can't get it from uh, the big you know big major companies like Ranger and um, and these other ones then then that would be an issue so uh, you know like I said uh, people you know have not required them to wear the half mask for the COVID virus yet um, but um, Again, it puts a lot of onus on the industry side, to, you know, to do this hazard assessment and say, what are you going to do? I've got construction companies that they're all going to wear it, but you know, if they 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 find they can't get it now, what are you going to do? Well, then I think you go to the surgical mask and the cloth mask with the other ones because you have to go through it. Otherwise, you're just going to completely stop construction or other work. You can keep the social distancing. This this has worked in, you know, South Korea. That's why I showed the picture of the auto facility because. You're talking about a country that at the same time as the United States with the, the cases, and they went to the surgical masks, and they went to the gloves, and it's worked, and their death rates are way lower than any of the other countries. So, you know, people want to sometimes knock the surgical mask and these homemade respirators and stuff that have, like, the furnace filter. But you're looking at a country that doesn't have enough N95s for all its workers, and they're doing a great job. So... You know, I would say yes. When you look at that video, they're not wearing, or the photo, they're just wearing surgical masks, and it's working. So I think construction could use that same model and work also. Uh, oh, well, Granger has a three-order backlog for the uh, N95 filtering face piece, but I didn't realize the uh, the uh, half mask cartridge respirators were there because I just bought mine just a couple weeks ago. Uh, place requires N95. How can you get employees fit test required sh with places shut down? Well, you can do it just before they start work. I mean, fit testing doesn't take very long, you know. And, you know, like I said, I've talked to some good OSHA people. You know, I tell people I like the standard chloride test. If it passes that, they're good to go. I can test with one tube. I can test 50 people with that standard chloride, you know. And uh, and, and all, all standard chloride looks like this. It's just going to be a... So it's going to be a little tube like this. It costs about three dollars, and you're going to have a little puffer or a ball, and you can do it. Again, it's, it's designed for the N100. If you use it on an N95 and it passes, it's good. It just when it doesn't pass, it may not be a legitimate fail. You might have to test it with Bitrix or something else. Uh, the Bitrix tubes, I buy I buy them seems like every week now, so I haven't seen the shortage on it, uh, uh, nor the stannic chloride. So. You can go through it, and that's why, like I said, I've shown you know you could do the standard chloride. Um, the test works again. If it if it passes that test, that's a good test to pass, and uh, you can go through it and uh, get your work site just before they start work. It doesn't take that long, and there's plenty of videos to show you how to use these different tests, as well as the manufacturers all got the same thing. So thank you very much. We had a lot of questions. We have uh, hundreds of people that came into this thing, and I, you know, again. Uh, you know, it's it's changing every day. Every day we're getting new information and try to at least, you know, give you some updates of what's happening. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much.